Thank you. It's really been a pleasure to visit here today. I've had uh, uh, <coughs> met some new friends and some old friends, and we've had some wonderful conversations on fundamental problems um, in uh, physics, which I'm not going to tell you about today. I'm going to tell you about some other problems having to do with um, what I'm calling fundamental physics. Now, fundamental is a loaded word, and everyone likes to be fundamental. Nobody likes to be unfundamental. What I mean by fundamental physics is uh, that branch of physics that tries to understand uh, the underlying principles in a very reductionist sense of how the universe works, what it's made out of, what the elementary particles, atoms, quarks, electrons that make up all of the matter that we can observe, and what are the nature of the fundamental laws of physics that act on these particles and produce the dynamical structures that explain our observations of the physical world. Um, I will try to explain to you uh, the current state of this field, which used to be called elementary particle physics, um, sometimes is called um, string theory nowadays. And uh, I will explain what, the, what we do understand, but I will largely explain what we don't understand and the problems we are facing, which, in effect, uh, as was hinted at by my banquet speech, are the frontiers of our subject. Now, the field of elementary particle physics is one in which enormous advances were made in the last century where we uh, largely figured out uh, what goes on inside the atoms that make up all the matter we see around us. And we identified both the constituents of matter and the nature of the forces that act on those constituents. So the constituents of matter, we learned, are electrons and that surround the nucleus, the very small nucleus of atoms, and <clears throat> give rise to the structure of atoms, the structure of molecules, to chemistry, to biology, to all of macroscopic physics. And towards the end of the 20th century, we started to probe inside the incredibly small nucleus at the center of atoms, and learned that the nucleons that make up the nucleus, the proton and the neutron, uh, are made out of elementary particles that we finally identified and understood to be quarks. So, in a sense, all the matter that we have ever observed, we now understand as the Greeks supposed a long, long time ago, are made out of little point-like objects. Uh, they call them atoms. We now understand that the atoms themselves have structure. They have electrons surrounding the nucleus, which in, is made out of quarks. And the other part of the story is to understand the laws of nature, the, which are expressible in mathematical form, and describe how these quarks and electrons interact often in such complicated ways that they give rise to the marvelous structure and variety of physical uh, phenomena in the universe. And it turned out that three forces are needed. The force of electricity and magnetism that acts on the electron and on the nuclei and holds the electrons in place around the nucleus and was known already and understood in its classical form in the 19th century. And two forces that act only within the nucleus, the strong and the weak nuclear force. The understanding of all of these forces and of the nature of the elementary particles, the quarks and the leptons, constitute what particle physicists call uh, the standard model of 
elementary particles. Uh, it really should be called the standard theory. It's a extremely precise, rigorous, well-defined theory that whose equations can be summarized on one t-shirt and which is schematically described by this diagram in which all the elementary particles that we have discovered and most me measured most of their properties and all that are needed to describe all the matter we've ever produced in laboratories or observed on Earth or in other stars and the three forces, forces which are mediated in our modern understanding by particles themselves. The quanta of the fields that mediate the force are, for example, in the case of electromagnetism, the quanta of light, the photon, the carrier of the electromagnetic force, and uh, ripples in that field show up as light rays. Similarly, we have the weak and <clears throat> strong nuclear forces are mediated by particles we call gluons and W and Zs. Uh, ordinary matter, the matter that we are made out of, that is not so radioactive, radioactive as to disappear immediately, is made up out of protons and neutrons, which are made up of up and down quarks. Electrons revolve around the nuclei, and neutrinos are their partners in some sense. But we've also discovered that there are two other similar families of quarks, which, except for their masses, they're quite much heavier, uh, are similar in all characteristics to the first and best-known family. And we give them strange names like charm and strange quarks, top and bottom quarks, and, and their neutrinos and uh, heavy electrons like the muon the tau, and so on. In any case, this is all the matter that we need, it seems, more or less, with one exception, and all the forces that we need with a major exception, the force that makes this go up and down and fall, the force of gravity, which plays very little role in the structure of atoms and nuclei. So at this point, we ignore it. <coughs> now I'm going to teach you a bit about the standard model and one of its mysteries, namely the nature of these three totally apparently different forces, force of electromagnetism mediated by the electromagnetic field and its quanta, which is the quanta of light, the force, the strong force that holds the quarks together inside the nucleus mediated by a similar field called the chromodynamic field and couples quarks together, and the weak nuclear force mediated by a weak nuclear field whose quanta are W and Z uh, particles. Now, these forces share a common characteristic that is very deep and profound. In some sense, all of these forces are the same kind of force and yet they manifest themselves in ways that are totally different uh, in the world that we observe in macroscopic physics, in atomic physics, and nuclear physics. The fact that they're all the same suggests that they are profoundly related and perhaps even unified at some scale, and that's one of the frontiers, the current frontiers. And the fact that they seem so different in ordinary atomic, nuclear, macroscopic life uh, has to do with a profound understanding of the quantum vacuum. And I'm going to try to explain that a bit. But before I do, let me just remark that this theory we have, based on these understanding of these forces and the measured properties of these elementary constituents of matter, is an extraordinarily successful theory of fundamental physics. Um, it is extraordinarily well tested in thousands of different experiments with extraordinary precision. Sometimes precision uh, which tests the comparison of theory to experiment to one part in a billion or even better. 
And it works, as far as we can tell, for almost all observations that we have made uh, from the scale of nano nanometers, a billionth of a billionth of a centimeter or less, to the edge of the universe. The same forces and physics described by the standard model accounts for the structure and evolution of stars and of galaxies. And together with a classical understanding of gravity accounts for just about everything we have so far, with one or two exceptions, um, <coughs> measured about the physical universe. That's the scale of applicability of this theory, standard theory, is amazing. 60 orders of magnitude, 60 factors of 10 same theory can account, from quarks to nuclei to atoms to stars to the universe. But I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about its successes and its tests and how well it works, because as I said in Stockholm, the uh, most important product of knowledge is ignorance. And, uh, as the dean told you, you know, you should remember that, but not, you shouldn't applaud stupid ignorance. Stupid ignorance leads to bigotry and to wars and to hatreds and, and to mistakes. But informed ignorance, the questions that we can ask once we understand things well enough, we can ask, in fact, we're, we're driven to ask new questions, questions that are scientific. And I distinguish between questions that are scientific and questions that are not. And questions that are scientific are questions that can be answered. Do you have a way of thinking about them that you can approach their answers by observation or by controlled experiments or by theoretical modeling, theoretical reasoning? Those are interesting questions. And by the time science gets to the stage where it can ask a question in a way that it can be answered by these methods, the answer is usually not far away. And through the history of science, we've gone through periods where questions that were asked by philosophers and religious leaders and were not scientific questions became scientific and then were rapidly answered. And so that for a scientist, that's, it's the ignorance that's the most exciting part of science. Once you've learned something and understood it, uh, okay, it's fun, but it's much more interesting to be challenged by the open questions. That's what drives science. We are always, I like to say, uh, moving out in a sea of ignorance, enlarging the realm of our knowledge. I'll come back to this picture at the end of the talk where I will um, ask, how long can this go on? Can we go on learning new things forever? Might it end? The moment, as I said, in Stockholm, there is no danger of ending. There are so many fascinating questions to ask. There are questions within this fundamental theory that we have, there are aspects of it which we're not totally sure of. And like everything in science, we must continually test the predictions of our theory in order to make sure that it's correct. Or perhaps there's some small imperfection which will tell us that it either needs modification or it needs to be replaced. Uh, there are phenomena that we have observed recently that don't easily fit into the standard model. Dark matter that seems to pervade the universe is uh, the best example of this. Dark energy, a sort of energy of the vacuum and pressure of the vacuum that causes the accelerated expansion of the universe is another one of these um, puzzles, um, somewhat of a theoretical puzzle, but a puzzle nonetheless at the moment. 
the fact that these forces that we need to describe the physical standard model seem very similar but are quite different uh, suggests that we look for a way of unifying these forces. And we are also being challenged nowadays to question the actual, once again, the most primary of our concepts about physical reality, namely space and time itself. So these are the issues I'll briefly describe uh, where we stand um, with respect to them. And, um, and I'm going to try to tie them all together by relating them to the properties of the vacuum. In fact, particle physics, fundamental physics, uh, largely is a, an attempt to understand nothing. Once we understand the vacuum, the rest is kind of trivial, usually. Particles that make up atoms and people and so on are all little ripples in the vacuum. First thing to understand is the vacuum. And I, I made a joke of that and said, well, we, the goal is to understand nothing, because that is most people's vision of what the vacuum is. The vacuum is like this slide, nothing. That is a uh, reasonable description of the classical vacuum, but not a good description of the quantum vacuum. And it's the properties of the quantum vacuum that I are going to give, give rise to many of the reasons that explain why these three forces that act within the atom appear to be so different, although fundamentally they're really the same kind of force. It's the properties of the vacuum that explain why quarks are confined, it's asymptotic freedom, that among the rest explains why you can't pull quarks out of the nucleus like electrons out of the atom, why there aren't wires that conduct quarks as there are wires that conduct electrons why the properties of the quantum vacuum that explain the, the so-called so Higgs mechanism that we're waiting for its final verification from the LHC and give rise to the masses of the elementary quarks and leptons. And it's the property of the hypothetical property of the quantum vacuum that allows us to imagine new and profound symmetries of space and time. And I'll discuss one of them, supersymmetry. So in quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics that we use to describe uh, the real world, uh, the vacuum is a very interesting place. It's not it doesn't look like this at all. It's not the boring, empty space like what you might imagine. This is a description of what the room, this room would look like if we removed everybody from the room and all the atoms and all the molecules and turned off all the fields, no electric fields, no magnetic fields. You're left with nothing. That's classical vacuum. But classical vacuum is empty and quite boring. It's the ground state of the system. You remove all the energy, everything relaxes. Quantum mechanics, that can't be the case. This was understood in the earliest days of quantum mechanics, sort of, in a sense, expressed by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle or a consequence of that that every dynamical object, including all the um, quantum fields, fluctuates. Because when you observe it, you disturb it, and it moves, in a sense. 
So that whereas you can picture a classical pendulum in its lowest energy state as having no motion at all and being totally still, clearly that's quantum mechanically inconsistent, say, with the uncertainty principle, since this has a definite position and no momentum, definite momentum. And when I observe the pendulum, I must inevitably interact with it. The light that I shine on the pendulum to see if it's there and motionless gives it a kick. And there's some what we call zero point motion of this dynamical variable, of this little pendulum. The same is true with quantum fields, with the electromagnetic field in a quantum theory of electromagnetism, which can be thought of as a lots of little pendulum. And when you take this empty vacuum and try to see, determine whether it has all the electric and magnetic fields actually turned off and zero, you interfere with this vacuum, cause little fluctuations in the electromagnetic field itself. So I'm going to show you a picture of what the vacuum looks like at a uh, scale of resolution of one nucleus, of one proton. Now, it's, I can't do that. I can't show you a photograph or a movie of some way of picturing or observing the structure of the vacuum at that scale, but I can show you the result of a calculation in our theory of the strong nuclear force and the strong nuclear fields that give rise to that force. And this is what it looks like. The quantum vacuum is full of fluctuating fields, and this is one way uh, of, the, of picturing them. Uh, these are measures, if you want, of the fluctua fluctuating regions of different colors are um, different uh, ways of measuring the magnitudes of these fluctuating chromodynamic fields that act between quarks and give rise to the nuclear force. This is not a simple, eh, boring, empty state. So with our conventional description, it, would be, it looks like a complicated dynamical medium. And it's a much better way of thinking about the lowest energy state or the vacuum in a quantum mechanical system of many electrons or of quantum fields. Now, it will, it's the properties of this state, this empty vacuum, that cause the various forces of nature that act within atoms and molecules and nuclei, electromagnetism, weak and strong forces, to be different. Because at the core, they turn out to be the same thing. The only difference between them is one, two, three. Electromagnetism is a theory with one kind of charge, electric charge. There's a field that acts whose source is electric charge. The weak and strong nuclear forces that act within the nucleus are at their core theories with two kinds of charges or three kinds of charges. But aside from that, they're the same kind of theory. The charges that source these special kinds of fields that Maxwell and Faraday discovered in the case of one charge. And uh, this first sight appears kind of crazy because, first of all, you know, electromagnetism is a force that we feel it. Uh, we've all felt it when you've 
shuffled along and felt a spark fly from your finger, or you touch a, uh, uh, a wire and you feel the uh, flow of electrons, it's not necessarily very pleasant. You've never felt the flow of quarks, or a something like a quark magnetism that would repel to magnetically charged um, quark systems. So why are they so different, these different kinds of forces? The force of the weak force is very weak and acts only at very short distances inside the nucleus. No one has ever felt a weak force at macroscopic distances. The force mediated by the electromagnetic field, or by that photon you saw going back and forth, is the easiest to understand, and indeed, you don't need much more than high school physics to learn about the Coulomb force that exists between charged electrons and charge of positive and negative charge between electrons and their, say, antiparticles of opposite charge. It's a long-range force. It falls off like inverse square law. You wiggle the charges. You, this field, whose field lines are described here, undulate. Those ripples are, in fact, light rays. And they travel with a velocity of light. In quantum theory of electromagnetism, we say that the force is mediated by the quanta, the particles, the quantized um, packets of energy and momentum that uh, the so-called photon, the quanta of light. Such a force law uh, gives rise to Coulomb's law. The ability to pull one electron away from another electron and ionize an atom. The energy, as a f if you plot it versus the distance between the electron and, say, the positron, the anti-electron, uh, saturates. If you pull them far enough away, you can ionize the electron. You can ionize the atom, as we do in order to create uh, electricity and charges running through wires. The weak and nuclear and strong nuclear forces are, if it wasn't for the properties of the quantum vacuum, would be exactly the same. In the case of electromagnetism, you can forget about the quantum properties of the vacuum. They are very small and have very little effect on this picture under most circumstances. But that's not the case for the weak nuclear force. There, there are two charges. And we give them names. We say there's an up charge and a down charge. There are two kinds of quarks, and they differ in their weak charge. But they're both, like the electric charge, charges. There are just two of them. And the same is true of the electron and the neutrino. They also come with this these two charges. And just like in electromagnetism, there are fields that mediate the force between these charges, except now, since there are two charges, there are more fields. There are actually two times two, minus one. Always got to remember the minus one. Those are described. Their quanta are the so-called W and Z mesons. And they can do more interesting things. They can, for example, turn a up quark into a down quark by emitting a quanta of this field, and which then turns in, say, to a neutrino and a positron. Now, these up and down quarks are usually inside the proton. And when that the up quark turns into a down quark, proton turns into a neutron with the emission of an electron and a neutrino. When the nucleon is within a, um, a nucleus, like gold, it can turn into platinum. 
And this is known as radioactivity or the transportation of elements. But so the having two charges, you have more fields, and these fields can do more interesting things. They can turn one charge into another, thereby changing the atomic number, changing the uh, ele one element into another. But there's another reason why the weak force is different, and that is, has to do with the property of the vacuum. That's the reason the weak force is not a force that we feel at atomic distances or macroscopic distances. And that has to do with the so-called Higgs mechanism. So if the vacuum were as trivial as we would imagine, just emptiness, nothing else could be, was excited or fluctuating, then our quarks, oops, our quarks and leptons would be totally massless. And they would move with the speed of light through this classical symmetric vacuum. The reason they don't, the reason they have a mass, is because there is some other stuff that lives, some other field, some other stuff that lives in the quantum vacuum and is, pervades it, breaks a symmetry, which I've indicated here, but let me not get into that. We call it a condensate. It's as if the vacuum is filled with this inert condensate of this field invented by Higgs and others. And moving in that condensate, the electrons and quarks bounce off the condensate, if you want, as if they're moving in some viscous medium and acquire a mass. Not only did they acquire a mass, but the carriers of the force the W's and Z's that mediate the force between the quarks and the leptons acquire a mass. And instead of giving rise to a force that acts at very large, long distances, long range force, only acts at very short distances. That's the so-called Higgs mechanism. And ripples in this Higgs condensate would be observable as particles. And that is the famous Higgs particle that is now being looked for at the LHC. The ripples in this condensate that give rise to the masses of the quarks and of the carriers and produce this very short range force. Well, that yet hasn't been seen, the ripples of this condensate. That's what we are looking for, and there, some of us think we've seen it, but it's still somewhat of an open question. Now, what about the strong nuclear force, my favorite force? Well, there, there are three charges. Each quark comes in through what we call three colors, simply three charges. Up quark, red, blue, these are just labels. Three kinds of quarks, three kinds of charges. And once again, the force is mediated by a field very much like the electromagnetic field. We call it the chromodynamic field because it couples to color. And if it was just, we just had this simple classical vacuum, there would exist this field, field lines between a quark and an anti-quark, and the force would fall off like 1 over r squared, and it would just be like electromagnetism. You could pull the quarks apart and have them run in wires, except you'd have three kinds of currents. Red current, right? blue current, white current. But now the structure of the quantum vacuum in this theory is 
much more powerful. That has to do with the nature of these carriers, uh, which themselves are colored or can change one color into another, so they have, in fact, two colors. And that, these quarks are living in this medium. And it turns out, that's what we discovered, in effect, that this medium does not like to have this field running through it, and it tries to squeeze these field lines as much as it can, but it can't completely because of these sources that create the field lines. So it does the best it can, and it squeezes them to form a tube like this in this complicated medium. And that's the phenomena that we call asymptotic freedom. It implies two things. One, that the quarks, when they're very close together, interact weakly, weakly, more and more weakly. That's not obvious from this picture. What's obvious from this picture is that when you try to pull them apart, the force doesn't saturate. In fact, the energy of this flux tube grows linearly without bound. You can never, without an expenditure of an infinite amount of energy, pull the quarks apart. So the force gets stronger at large distances. The ionization energy is infinite. You can never take a quark out of the nucleus. That's called confinement. And the converse of that is the fact that the force gets weak at uh, short distances. That's asymptotic freedom, which is what we observe in the laboratory and which led us to understand that quarks are there inside nucleons and behave like free particles. And that, in fact, led to this theory, QCD, of quarks with three kinds of charges and a force very similar to electromagnetism, except that there are three kinds of charges, and that the vacuum squeezes the flux tubes together. In that theory, indeed, when you do the calculation, and again, draw these, these uh, pictures which show the quantum fields, the quantum chromodynamic fields between the quark and the antiquark as you separate them, you see that you get, instead of them spreading out as they would without the strange properties of the quantum vacuum, you get this linear flux tube. Well, that discovery did lead to this very nice banquet in Sweden, where you see, uh, you see the, uh, this is the queen. This is the queen to, to, to be in her own right. She's, you know, in Sweden, you don't have to be, doesn't go to the first male. She is the eldest daughter, so she will be Queen Victoria someday. And when they give you a Nobel Prize, aside from the Czech and the medal, they give you a, a very nice document, beautifully, with an uh, original picture by, a, by an artist, in this case describing three quarks trying very hard to get out of the proton, but bound together by this crazy force. And this, again, is a picture of what actually happens in the real world when you pull these three quarks about. You again see that the flux this quantum chromodynamic field is being squashed to form this kind of trident. That, uh, again, makes it impossible to pull a quark out of the proton. So all these forces that we use to describe all of atomic, molecular, nuclear physics are all the same force. The only difference between them is the properties of the quantum vacuum which suggests that they should be unified. It didn't have to be that way. They could have been totally different kind of forces, but they are. They're all these different ingredients uh, fit together seamlessly, as if they all come from a single kind of force, and a 
single kind of matter. And in fact, there are very simple extensions of the standard model where you embed the whole thing in one force law with five charges. You know, if you have three and two and one, you can make something with just five charges or ten. This is actually the picture with ten. Oops. And put all of the quarks and leptons into a natural system where they have these one, some combination of these five charges and account for all the matter we've ever seen, elementary matter, and, uh, and one force law. And then you could recognize that pieces of this force law are electromagnetism, pieces are the weak and strong nuclear forces. But of course, there's one problem with that. That is, you know, the electromagnetic force is much, much weaker than the strong nuclear force. That's why H-bombs are so much more powerful than TNT. So dynamite works on chemistry, which is electromagnetic interactions, forces. And atomic bombs, thermonuclear weapons, are work on nuclear forces, actually even just a small part of nuclear forces, the weakest possible nuclear force. So how can these be the same if the forces are so different? Well, that too has to do with this phenomena of uh, asymptotic freedom, because as you go, the force is only strong when the quarks are far apart. They're very, very close together. The force gets weaker. So it could be that this force, strong force, at very high energies or short distances, Uh, would be of the same magnitude. And one of the first things that was done when the standard model was completed in the 70s was to extrapolate our knowledge from where we now measure to very high, <laughs> high energies. And remarkably, the three forces that act within the atom seem to come together at a very high energy, many, many orders of magnitude beyond where we uh, presently observe. But the theory works, and nothing prevents theorists from doing this extrapolation. This fact is one of the most important clues that we have as to where the next frontier is observationally. What scale of energies will something new happen? This suggests that the new thing that will happen will be unification. Forces fit together, and their magnitudes coincide if you look at the phenomena at very short distances. When you look at that picture of the vacuum and scale down to very short distances, all of the structure goes away. So what you say is, OK, if we look at what goes on in the world at very, very short distances, and this distance here corresponds to something like 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. You would see one force. But most of our observations are made at distances like meters or centimeters or nanometers. And there, this vacuum, the quantum vacuum, has a lot of structure. We just sh showed you a picture of it. And that makes these different parts of the unique force look very different. That's how we understand that all the forces can be unified and yet appear to give rise to large-scale behavior that is very different. So this is a nice picture you would like to understand and unification of the forces. But it's also rather depressing because it's removed from present day observation by 15 orders of magnitude. And uh, there's no hope of building an accelerator 
that will directly probe such incredibly short distances. So if we're ever going to learn about this, we need either very good theoretical understanding or lots more clues. And one place we might get clues is just around the corner from present-day observation, a regime which is now becoming present-day observation, a trillion electron volt machine like the LHC at Geneva. And one of the things we expect from it is a discovery of a profound new symmetry of nature called supersymmetry. Now, the LHC is supposed to discover the Higgs particle and give a Nobel Prize to Francois Anglaire and Higgs. And that will happen. If it hasn't happened already, it will be very nice. But the really exciting thing for most of us is not that, but discovery of something new and for which we have no direct observational evidence yet. And the most exciting thing for me is supersymmetry. Symmetry principles, as we have learned over the last century from Einstein onward, are in some way at the foundation of just about everything we've learned in physics. And so uh, let me, I'd like to explain to you briefly what supersymmetry is because it is a profound new symmetry of physics which we haven't yet discovered. Symmetries of physics that we have discovered, for example, are rotational symmetry. You know, the laws of physics are invariant under rotation. If I do an experiment, throw this up, measure how long it takes to drop, rotate my laboratory 90 degrees, do the experiment again, I get the same answer. That's a symmetry of the laws of physics. Um, rotational symmetry. So supersymmetry is exactly the same. It's the laws of the statement that the laws of physics are invariant under rotations of superspace. So now you understand what supersymmetry is, right? Except I have to explain to you what superspace is. So superspace, well, is an extension of space, space time which is the arena in which we dis describe physical phenomena. Particles move as time goes on in space. Fields are functions of space and time. And symmetries are invariants of the laws of physics under rotations of, say, the x-axis into the y-axis of rotations in space or in space-time. So what is superspace? Superspace has another coordinate, more coordinates. It's as if we have more dimensions, but not exactly. These aren't ordinary dimensions that I'm adding. So instead of just x, y, z, we have theta. But theta is not an ordinary dimension. We can also talk about that, extra real dimensions. But here I'm talking about extra super dimensions. And super dimensions are new coordinates that you need to describe particles, fields, but are measured with numbers that anti-commute, numbers whose multiplication depends on the order. So theta 1 times theta 2 are two such numbers. And you don't get the same answer if you multiply theta 2 times theta 1. You get a minus. Same answer. Now, mathematicians, as you know, can invent all sorts of crazy things, crazy numbers like the square root of minus 1. It's called an imaginary number. i squared is minus 1. Now, what kind of number? Square is minus 1. These numbers are perfectly good numbers. They have rules. You multiply theta 1 times theta 2, you get something. But multiply the opposite order, you get the negative of that. Anyway, there's a whole 
definition theory of such Grassmannian numbers, so-called. And there's a beautiful mathematical extension of space-time that we use in physics to include supercoordinates measured with these anti-commuting numbers, and of the symmetries that rotate these coordinates into each other. You can rotate a supercoordinate into an ordinary coordinate, and so on. That's superspace. And it's uh, very appealing to a physicist because in physics, we have two kinds of particles, bosons and fermions, which have very different kinds of properties, statistically. And we can, it turns out, associate them with th these different coordinates in superspace. So it turns out that one can take every theory in physics that we've ever constructed and extend it to live, instead of living in ordinary space, to live in superspace. We imagine the particles are moving, not just in space, but also have a theta coordinate, and they're moving in superspace. When you translate that back to ordinary theory, ordinary space, and you can always do that in a very simple way mathematically. Oops. Skip that. You can always do that simply mathematically by Um, expanding your functions in a so-called Taylor series and replacing motion of one particle in superspace by two particles in ordinary space. These particles have what we call in physics different statistics. That's fascinating. I won't go into that. But it does mean that in supersymmetric extensions of our theories, supersymmetric theories for every particle that exists, we describe in ordinary space, there is a superpartner that describes if you want the motion of the same entity in superspace. If we do this to the standard model, we have our quarks, electrons, and photons, say, we predict that there must be a squark, we call it, a selectron and a photino. These are the funny names we've given to the partners of the observed particles. And none of them has ever been seen. Now, when you arrive to such a situation in physics, you say, OK, that just, the theory's wrong. But we could always say, no, the theory's OK. It's the fault of the quantum vacuum. These particles maybe haven't been seen because the quantum vacuum doesn't respect the symmetry. So for example, the laws of physics are invariant under rotations, right? I walk into this room, I say, that must be wrong. You're there, and if I rotate 90 degrees, I don't see anyone. So how can physics be invariant under rotations? Physics is invariant under rotations. This room is not invariant under rotations. If I just look at this room, it doesn't look rotationally invariant. But take the room and remove everybody from the room, all the people and the chairs and the molecules in the air, and you're left with the vacuum. And surely, that is rotationally invariant. And normally, we think it is. But maybe not. Remember that picture of the vacuum. It looked pretty complicated. Could you really tell that it was rotationally invariant? 
And if it's not rotationally invariant, then the simple consequences of the symmetry of the laws of physics under rotations won't be evident. There will be consequences, but not as simple as simply saying that these particles have to appear with a, the same mass that we should have seen them. Maybe, in fact, they could be much heavier. And that's the case. And we understand easily how that can occur. The quantum vacuum is not invariant under this new symmetry of rotations in superspace. Then this doubling of particles won't be evident until we go down to small enough scales where the vacuum looks invariant under rotation. OK, so that's a possibility, but why do we believe that we might have a chance of seeing that, seeing these new particles at energies of a TV, which we can now explore, and where we have perhaps some hope that the vacuum might begin to show that it is invariant under rotations in superspace? Well, there are a bunch of hints from nature. One is the unification of the forces. So I showed you this picture of the three forces. This is a more accurate picture of the inverse of the strength of the forces. So this curve here is describing the strong force. This is 1 over the strength. So small value means very strong. So very strong at low energies. And on a logarithmic scale, it increases like a linear function of the energy. So it's getting weaker and weaker. This means getting weaker. This is electromagnetism getting stronger. And after 30 years of doing lots of very high precision measurements in order to extrapolate better and better calculations, it's clear that in the standard model, these forces, these three lines, don't meet at a point. Which means that, OK, maybe the forces don't unify. We were just wrong before. Or maybe something's left out. And if you just put in supersymmetry, if you make the standard model supersymmetric, then you're adding all these supersymmetric particles, which at some energy begin to come in and play a role. And it turns out, bring these three lines together at a point to within 1% after extrapolating over 14 orders of magnitude, which is kind of nice. Now, that could be a indication that uh, unification occurs and supersymmetry is evident at a TV, which is what you need to make those curves turn over at a TV. Or it could be a coincidence. You never know in science. So there is this regularity which could be explained by saying there is this new symmetry which would show up at a TV, but you, that just could be a coincidence. The other important hint has to do with dark matter. So as you know, astrophysicists tell us that most of the matter in the universe most of the stuff, ordinary particles, um, don't consist of quarks and electrons. There's some new kind of matter that attracts things gravitationally, and that's how we see it indirectly. But um, they think it's very, some kind of very heavy, weakly interacting massive particle. But what is it? And we don't know. We haven't seen this new particle directly in the laboratory, haven't made these particles, and we haven't detected the dark matter wind that's passing through this room. But supersymmetric theories naturally predict that the lightest of these new particles would be a, a perfect candidate for dark matter. It would be a very heavy trillion of electron volts, 
hundreds of times heavier than the proton, a candidate for dark matter at those energies, those particles would, those masses, those particles would interact with themselves very, very little, and with quarks and leptons, very little would be neutral, wouldn't radiate. This would be perfect particles for candidates for dark matter. And it turns out that if those particles appear at around a trillion electron volts, then you can predict how much dark matter there would be in the universe and it comes out right. Well, we can test that. We can try to produce these supersymmetric particles and see whether they have the properties to be dark matter. But again, this is an important clue, but it's only a clue. It could be, again, a coincidence. There are other reasons. I don't have time to tell you all of them, but there are enough that make many of us think there's a very good chance that the Large Hadron Collider, which is now operating at an energy which could start producing such supersymmetric particles and detecting them in these incredible, uh, enormous detectors, um, could do so in the near future. It could also verify that the ripples in the Higgs condensate, the so-called Higgs particle. This is an example of what such a Higgs event would look like. And there has been, as you, many of you have heard, uh, a few months ago in December, the first reports of hints that the Higgs, in fact, has been discovered. This is a a compilation in one of the two experiments of data, and this bump at a mass of 125 GV is a what would be in most fields overwhelming evidence of the existence of a new particle. Particle physicists are, are kind of spoiled because of the high precision and standards that they have imposed on themselves to announce. So even with what uh, would look to be pretty good evidence, the experimenters, and they are the judges at this point, um, are not willing to, to uh, announce a discovery. But they're very close to doing so. And most likely, the Higgs will be discovered within uh, this year, as this signal becomes stronger. Supersymmetry is harder to discover. It's a very predictive new theory. It predicts lots of new particles and couplings, but the typical SUSY event, this again is a simulation of an event in these massive detectors where you see various trajectories of particles in the event, and what Many of these particles can be identified, and this is the kind of typical event which an experimental will look at and say, aha, here is perhaps a dark matter candidate. Because I don't see a large amount of missing energy and momentum that should be going out in this direction to make up the conservation of energy and momentum. So what you're looking for, one of the strongest signals for discovering new particles, is the absence of something. And that's much harder to make sure that you just haven't missed some neutrino, which also is hard to detect. <coughs> that, so supersymmetry hasn't yet even gotten to the stage of the Higgs, which in my opinion has already been discovered, but I'm not the experimentalist. Uh, in the case of supersymmetry so far, there have been, the hints have been very uh, less um, meaningful. But the discovery will be much more meaningful. Because once, when you read in the newspaper in a few years, or next year, or this year maybe, that, that physicists at CERN have discovered supersymmetry, 
what they're in fact discovering quantum dimension. So once we understand that this is a symmetry of nature, then we conclude from that, we must, that the correct mathematical description of, sp of the space in which particles live and which fields depend on is not just ordinary space-time, but super space-time. Space and time will have quantum dimensions. We might also discover evidence for new ordinary dimensions, but that actually is much less likely. Well, I don't really have time to tell you about the speculations uh, about what happens at these very high energies where the forces, we have these hints that the forces unify. But one thing is clear from the, is that we have to consider as well the fourth force of nature, the one that we all feel in the morning when we get out of bed and force of gravity. Gravity is the weakest force in the universe. Uh, in the atom, the force of gravity is 40 orders of magnitude less important than the you know, force of electromagnetism or the weak and strong force. It is totally negligible between, say, an electron and a nucleus. The only reason we feel it and that it plays an important role in the universe is that it that is that there is uh, essentially no anti-gravity. Gravity cannot be screened. Gravity is always attractive. Gravity, the source of gravity is energy and momentum. The charge of gravity, which in many ways is similar to these other forces, except that the charge is energy and momentum. And everything has positive energy, so everything is attracting. And that's why you can put together a big planet which exerts a measurable force on me. Just a lot of atoms pull, all pulling, and I can actually resist that force with just the expenditure of a little bit of chemical energy. So little old me is resisting. The whole Earth is pulling down on this thing. And just with a little bit of chemical energy, which is so much stronger inherently at ordinary distances, um, I can resist it. So gravity only becomes important under two circumstances, when you have lots of matter together, like planets or stars, or you go to very high energies. So, Because the source of gravity is the mass. Or the energy, really. The mass is just a measure of energy of objects that are at rest or moving slowly. But it really couples to energy. And two electrons, which are moving very fast with respect to each other, will attract each other gravitationally as strong as they will repel by electromagnetism. So the force of gravity increases very rapidly, quadratically with energy. And if you go to very high energies or very short distances, it, in effect, becomes comparable with the other forces of nature. And so the attempts to unify the forces must take that into account and unify them with gravity, which is what led most of us working on this subject to uh, string theory, which turned out to be a natural way of incorporating, uh, combining these kinds of forces, electromagnetic kinds of forces, uh, with the force of gravity in a very natural way. Well, we don't really know whether this works. It has many, many wonderful properties that give us hope that it contains a lot of the ingredients we need to describe all of the properties of the real world, the atomic and nuclear forces in addition to gravity. It is a, uh, but many mysteries remain. Its connection to the ordinary forces is 
and to the QCD in particular are quite profound. In fact, string theory began as an attempt to understand those flux tubes I showed you. Long before we understood the correct way of understanding the nature of these flux tubes that exist between quarks and antiquarks. Properties of the strong nuclear force led people to invent uh, strings. And that's not too surprising because these flux tubes between quarks and antiquarks, as you pull them apart, look like fat strings. And it was in the development of string theory in the beginning was in an attempt to understand the strong nuclear force, not a unified theory of everything. These so were so-called open strings because they had ends to which you could attach quarks. But then it was realized that these open strings could be closed, in fact, have to be closed. And once they were closed, it was discovered that the dynamics of these closed strings looked like gravity. So string theory turned out to unify the different kinds of forces of nature, those that are responsible for strong, weak, electromagnetism, forces in atoms and nuclei, and gravitational forces automatically. And has this interplay between these two descriptions uh, of the theory, either as closed strings and open strings, or uh, quantum fields that transmit the forces or gravity, have been increasingly useful uh, for understanding both aspects. Since this inevitably brings us to a theory of space and time, which is what Einstein taught us that gravity is, many of the most fascinating questions we've been led to in the search for unification have to do with space and time. For example, one of the first things that emerged in string theory was that the strings looked like they lived in more than three dimensions. Six dimensions, six extraordinary dimensions, and then extra super dimensions as well, but six extraordinary dimensions. <coughs> and to be consistent with the real world, one therefore must look for solutions of that string theory in which those dimensions were curled up. And there are such solutions where, so at each point in space now, there really are real, ordinary, extra dimensions all curled up into these little, beautiful manifolds whose structure can be deduced by solving the analog of Einstein's equations that determine the curvature and geometry of this internal space. Now, there are lots of such solutions. We were happy at the beginning when we found one or two, but now there's zillions and zillions. The fascinating thing about this is that the questions that within the standard approach to are impossible to answer, like who decides what the nature of the forces are, or what kind of matter you have, or what are the masses of the elementary particles, all these questions that the standard model is hopeless, it just has to take them as given, are geom geometricized here. They are determined by the shape of the hidden dimensions. Now, since we have lots and lots of solutions, doesn't mean we can predict what the masses are, or et cetera. We can look for solutions that look like the real world, and there are lots of those as well. But it's still in a remarkable clue to, as to the direction of hope in the end of trying to answer this is that there's a geometrical answer to such questions. Our real failure in string theory in a predictive sense is we really don't understand what the theory is. 
It's one of the most remarkable developments I've ever seen in or know about and totally unique in history of physics that people have developed a theory without knowing what it is, a theory which is totally rigid and rigorous and you can't modify it, but you can't write down the equations which you're solving either. What we really have are prescriptions for writing down solutions to equations we don't know. And we're not sure what is yet missing in this approach. Um, string so-called theory is not a theory, it's more like a framework, but what is missing uh, is not something we understand, and it might have to do with um, the fact that we are in string theory, or in this line of fundamental physics where we are doomed to have to deal with the dynamics of space and time, starting to ask new questions about the nature of physics and space-time itself. As far as space-time goes, our, our, our intuitive, childlike versions of vision, uh, understanding of space-time has changed in the history of physics the last two centuries dramatically, due to Einstein in particular. But uh, string theory suggests, as well as quantum gravity, that we're going to have to change it even more. This is uh, two quotes by two eminent string theorists. Ed Witten, who said, space and time may be doomed, or space and time are illusions. Now, those are very strong statements, and, and what could they mean? Space and time, especially, are absolutely fundamental in our formulation of physics. So what would it mean to say that they're illusions, or doomed? But this is what string theory strongly suggests. And, and in some sense, the major question that, uh, major challenge uh, at the moment in my opinion, in fundamental physics. What is the true nature of space and time? So what it, to say it's, space and time is doomed really means that these are inappropriate, they're not sharp enough c concepts to discuss some of the issues that we are being forced to discuss. In particular, the behavior of um, physics at arbitrarily short distances, times, and that Space and time should instead be regarded as a, an approximate concept that you use for describing big things where we're used, to, where it's a good approximation, or long things. Um, space and time, therefore, is some kind of an emergent concept, but then the question is, what is it made out of and how do we make it? That is a very difficult uh, issue, especially with respect to time. We have many examples of an uh, uh, increasing number of understanding of how space can be an emergent concept. And we can have situations where a better description does not involve a fundamental concept of space-time points. But time is very hard to eliminate. Um, and we don't know how to do that. And then there are issues about space-time which have to do with the fact that we are faced with, in fundamental physics, with imagining a theory and a set of rules that give us a solution. But in the context of the universe, in context of dynamical space-time, uh, it's hard to see how we can avoid answering questions like, how did the universe begin? Because that's part of what we're trying to describe, the dynamics of space and time. And how can we determine an initial condition? Is that something that physics is supposed to determine? What happened before or at the Big Bang? We know a lot about the universe, but very little about 
the very beginning, if anything. Even worse than that, because if we just, if our, the object is the universe, then that's the whole space-time history from beginning to the end. And we need, it would appear, to specify a boundary conditions or that determine not just the nature of the beginning, but equally well the nature of the end, or what happens on the boundary, if there is a boundary. And here we simply don't know what the rules are. So we're in a situation where we are uh, maybe not able to get away with avoiding answering questions like this, which used to be religious, but are becoming more scientific and well formulated, and maybe we're forced to answer them to get a uh, answer to the questions such as why is the muon heavier than the electron? Well, these are very hard questions. It's conceivable we could even answer them or not. So how long is this game going to go on of looking deeper and deeper into the fundamental structure and workings of matter? Can we go on forever? So, uh, you know, when I gave this banquet speech in Stockholm, I was telling the Nobel Foundation that they're very lucky because unless there are new problems, there are no new prizes, and, uh, and they could run out. But there's no worry about that. But who knows? We may construct a final theory. Is that possible? Or maybe we're just not smart enough to do this. Shaking your head. Could be. And we may lose the will to proceed. So I'm going to say a word or two about the first two issues. First has to do with what I call the geometry of knowledge. It's always very nice to construct a geometrical model, like, and the usual model people have of knowledge I find is really very bad. It's called the onion model. Uh, knowledge is an onion. You peel it away layer by layer, and you get to the core. But that's really the, exactly the opposite of what we do. So remember that picture I had of we're moving out in in a, uh, into a sea of ignorance, and we're extending the domain of knowledge. So it's just the opposite of the onion model. And uh, this geometrical model is, is better than the onion model because it explains certain facts that uh, might appear um, mysterious about knowledge and ignorance and wisdom. So first of all, in this picture, you see knowledge is growing. Everything inside that ellipse is what we know. Maybe we don't know it really, but it's in the library so we can look it up or resort to Wikipedia, which is usually wrong, often wrong. But anyway, knowledge increases like the volume of that red region, right? Now what about ignorance? Ignorance is also increasing. There's a lot of ignorance in this picture, all that black region, but most of that ignorance we're not aware of. Right? So, you know, um, the Greeks knew a lot, but they were not aware that they didn't know how to unify the weak and electromagnetic and strong forces because they didn't know what these were. But now we know enough to ask those very for well formulated questions. So the Ignorance that we're aware of is just on the boundary of knowledge. We can look out and see the stuff we don't know. So ignorance increases like the surface. So that explains, by the way, why you know, the more we study, the more we know, but the more we are aware of what we don't know and we feel ignorant. It also explains why wisdom increases. Because, you know, wisdom is sort of like the ratio of knowledge to ignorance, and this is, increases like the volume to the surface. 
for a while at least. So now we can use this model to uh, explore the question, can we construct a final theory? That question really reduces to, is there a finite amount of ignorance? <laughs> now we know cases where that wasn't the case, and we constructed a final theory. It was called exploration. So when people started exploring the surface of the Earth, they also had a model like this, you know. This is what we knew, or what they knew, and we were pushing out into a sea of ignorance. And there were two possibilities. The Earth was flat, and you could go on exploring forever, and the, your map would get bigger like the area of what you knew, and you'd know that there was this boundary, which increased only like the, you know, the uh, circumference. So you'd, and you'd never run out of new territory to explore. That, of course, isn't what happened. It only looked flat locally, and it was actually round. And eventually, we ran out of new territories to explore, and explore societies shut down. We ran out of ignorance, and exploration was over. We had a final map. Actually, you can now go into details, but the global map was finished, at least this current era. So the question is, is the sea of ignorance compact or not? So there are two possibilities. It's unbounded and infinite, you know, like this. And then we're in business forever. And uh, then we're in business forever. And there's an infinite amount of ignorance, and science can go on. and Fundamental physics, at least, can go on forever and ever. And I don't see any reason why that couldn't be the case. Or it could be compact and finite, like the surface of the Earth, and uh, eventually we'll run out of ignorance and construct the final theory. Now, that could also be the case. I'm totally agnostic. But there is an experimental test. So how would you begin to know whether you're, this is the case or that, it, or it's flat? Well, I think the signs would, there would be a few signs that you'd, first of all, you'd begin to run out of interesting questions. Like we ran out of places to explore. You'd begin to notice that the ignorance was decreasing. There's no sign of that. So um, that's what I told him in Sweden. If, by the way, if this happened, if we did run out of ignorance, would that be the end of physics? Not really, because just like we, with the Earth, you can, even if you have this global theory of the Earth, you can still explore um, many other directions. And so this wouldn't be the end of physics, even in this reductionist sense. There's all the un infinite variety of stuff that perhaps, in some reduction of sense, would emerge from a final theory, whatever it is, but still itself has an infinite extent of exploration at the more macro level. However, there's another danger. That is, that we may be too dumb to proceed. Now, this is something we should worry about, because it's not you know, easy to imagine things that we are too dumb to perceive, to understand. But we have many examples that that might be the case. For example, you know, my dog uh, cannot understand quantum mechanics, no matter how hard I try to teach him. And, you know, there's no question that the dog can learn certain things, but it's not going to, cannot understand quantum mechanics. There are limitations to the dog's intelligence. Are there limitations to our intelligence, to our collective intelligence? 
Well, I think there are many ways. So, and it's kind of hard to imagine that it would be kind of arrogant to imagine that there wouldn't be, right? Who are we to claim that, you know, at this stage of, human, of evolution, we are capable? Well, there are a lot of outs to this, poss this danger as well. First, um, language has a certain infinite cap ca uh, capacity, capability. As Chomsky remarked, a newborn infant can, and often does, utter a sentence that no one has ever uttered before. It can do so. There's a certain infinite capacity to language, and mathematics is the highest embodiment of language. It clearly has some, some measure of, some infinite measure of capacity. Maybe not infinite enough, but once you, at least, it, it has a certain, a certain infinite capacity, which might be enough. Second of all, um, we is not a time invariant thing. We can, if we discover such limitations, we might evolve, or we might um, speed up the evolution that might, would be necessary for us to develop additional capacity. But again, there is an experimental way of determining this. What would be the signs that we are getting to the stage where we're too dumb to proceed, where these problems, which appear so difficult, emergence, space, time, unification of all the forces, whatever, uh, initial condition for the universe, these are issues that are beyond our capacity. What would be the indication? Now, you can't ask old men like me whether the fact, you know, you, there's often the case that people who've struggled with problems for many, many years come to the conclusion that there is no solution because they haven't found it. I think the best way of deciding whether uh, we are faced with questions that cannot be answered by ourselves, the best indication that we're getting to that situation would be if people trying to approach the frontiers of science took longer and longer to begin to be, make significant contributions. Then you would feel that they were coming up against some wall. But it's not the case. It might appear superficially that we are faced now with much more difficult problems than we were 400 years ago when it was trivial. But People, brilliant young minds, are able today, as 400 years ago, in their early 20s, to get to the frontiers of the most difficult areas of science and to make substantial progress. So I regard that as a sign that, as a species, we're not nearing the point. We seem, there's no evidence that we're nearing the point of uh, impossible tasks. I think. More likely, the biggest danger is that we may lose the will and the means to go forward in the areas of fundamental science that I described. We uh, would love to be able to do experiments that seem totally impossible and beyond all. Uh, and it could very well be that in part of astrophysics, cosmology, uh, we're getting to a point where the resources and the will power of human society uh, would not allow us to construct the uh, instruments that would, allow, that would enable us to answer, give us the clues necessary and the tests of our theories to address many of the most fundamental questions. So, I don't know what the answer is here. I just hope not. It would be pretty sad if uh, that is what stops this effort. There is, again, I see no sign of that happening now, but there are some signs that we're approaching the limits of our resources. And here we just have to quote David Hilbert, who on his grave uh, wrote, we 
must know, we will know.